Good morning, everyone. Uh, pleased to welcome uh, General Votel from Central Command here to share with you his thoughts about what's going on within his combatant command. Lots of issues, of course, to talk about. And without any further ado, we'll let uh, General Votel uh, begin. And do have to keep an eye on the clock because he does have other meetings here in the day. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Peter. Appreciate it. And uh, for all of you, it's good to good to be here this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk with you and provide you an update on U.S. military activities in the Central Command area of responsibility, and particularly as it relates to the ongoing fight in Iraq and Syria against the terrorist organization ISIL or Daesh. Um, since taking command of CENTCOM at the end of March, I spent a good uh, bit of my time in the region. As you all know, it is a fascinating and strategically important part of the world. It's also a part of the world that's dealing with a myriad of complex challenges, including sectarianism, economic and political disenfranchisement, ungoverned or undergoverned spaces, and pervasive terrorism. During my travels, I've met with many of our partners, both government and military leaders, and I will tell you the one thing that's been made very clear to me is that our partners value their relationships with the United States. They value our leadership, and they want to work together to accomplish common objectives. Ultimately, at CENTCOM, our intent is to do what is necessary militarily to improve stability and security in the region. And we are achieving good effects in a number of areas and pursuing opportunities that are paying significant dividends. And I'll give you a few examples. Certainly, maritime security is an area where both preparation and collaboration continue to achieve good effects. Nearly 30 percent of the energy vital to the global economy passes through the three maritime choke points in the region, the Suez Canal, the Bab el-Mandeb, and the Strait of Hormuz. Our efforts, together with the efforts of our partners and allies, help to ensure the free flow of commerce through these choke points and to other parts of the world. In recent months, we've seen an uptick in confrontations by Iranian vessels in the Arabian Gulf. I personally witnessed this behavior last month while on the USS New Orleans transiting the Strait of Hormuz. Some of you were with me. An IRGC, uh, Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps missile ship, and three fast attack crafts demonstrated aggressive behavior in the vicinity of our ship. In recent days, we have witnessed even more provocative activity by the IRGCN Navy vessels. That type of behavior is very concerning, and we hope to see Iran's naval forces act in a more professional manner. In contrast, I cannot say enough uh, uh, about the professionalism of our naval forces. I was pleased to see how well they handled the situations that were prevent presented to them. They remained measured in their response, and they helped to keep a tense situation from escalating into an international incident. I was very, very proud of our sailors and their leaders. Our efforts in Afghanistan also continue to pay dividends. We, along with our coalition partners, have made tremendous investments in that country over the last 15 years. The Afghans today are in the lead, and they are taking the fight to the enemy through their sustainable security strategy. They are doing so while dealing with some tough challenges in places like Helmand Province, for example. They continue to demonstrate resiliency, and they are proving capable of defending their sovereign spaces. Meanwhile, our train, advise, and assist, and our counterterrorism efforts in Afghanistan are also proving effective to include our efforts against the, the ISIL affiliate in Afghanistan, the Islamic State in the Khorasan province. During a recent visit to Afghanistan, I spent time with our train, advise, and assist teams and with the Corps commanders leading the Afghan forces. Across the board, I was extremely impressed by their skill, their determination, and their extraordinarily high level of resiliency. <clears throat> our recent combined operations against the Islamic State in the Khorasan resulted in destruction of 25 percent of their forces. With President Obama's decision to keep 8,400 U.S. troops in country through 2017, and with the additional authorities that have allowed us to target uh, the Islamic State in the Khorasan and to accompany the Afghan forces, I'm confident that we will see the Afghans continue to build on the momentum achieved to date. Of course, we remain very focused on the ongoing fight against ISIL in Iraq and Syria. As a result of our coalition military operations, the group's capabilities have been greatly degraded and dismantled in both countries, and they've lost a significant amount of, ter of the territory they once held. In just the last few weeks alone, ISIL lost a hold on the Manbij city and the Jarabalus and Arai border crossings in Syria, and Kiara and Khalidiyah in Iraq. And in the last few days, U.S. back forces, coalition back forces, defeated an attempted counterattack by ISIL fighters in Shaddadi in, north, in northern Syria. 
The cumulative effect of these operations has served to cut off key lines of communication for ISIL while restricting the enemy's ability to bring in additional fighters. As you look across the full battle space, you see that ISIL is under more pressure now than at any other time in the campaign. We are causing the enemy to have to look in multiple directions, and they are struggling to respond under this pressure. Generally speaking, I do believe our approach, which requires that we work by, with, and through the indigenous forces, is working. We are making progress against ISIL in Iraq and Syria. That said, challenges do remain, and there is much work still to be done to defeat this enemy in both countries. We remain concerned about their external operations capability, as well as their adaptiveness. As Secretary Carter has said on a number of occasions, defeating ISIL in Iraq and in Syria is necessary, but not sufficient. We need to continue to work together across boundaries, the whole of U.S. government and the international community, to truly defeat this organization. Perhaps even more important, we recognize that significant political challenges will also have to be addressed. To this end, we are making concerted effort to ensure that we synchronize the political and humanitarian assistance plans with our ongoing military plans and operations. This has been one of my main areas of focus during my repeated visits to Iraq over the last five months. And I've instructed our team at CENTCOM to explore ways that we may be able to work more closely with our interagency and our international partners to support these efforts and to ease the delivery of humanitarian aid in recently liberated areas until the security environment improves and allows for greater access to aid organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, we have proven time and again over the years that when we work together, difficult challenges can be overcome. And I remain confident that we will be successful in our shared endeavors in the coming days. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Start with uh, Bob Burns, the uh, General Hotel. Uh, Question for you about Syria. Uh, today, the Turkish presidential spokesman said the U.S. should end its policy of what he called uh, supporting the Kurdish forces at all costs. I'm wondering if you could respond to that and maybe comment on the broader point about whether it's possible to increase the Arab representation of the forces that you're developing in the SDF. Well, I'll, I'll leave it to the Department of State to talk to on the Foreign, foreign Ministry responses, but I, I will just say that, uh, you know, we, we uh, rely on both Turkey and the Syrian Democratic Forces to help us in our fight against ISIL. Both of them are critical to it. Turkey certainly plays an extraordinarily important role with their uh, access basing overflight, the variety of things that they do, and their, their operations along the border against ISIL are extraordinarily important and welcome. Uh, at the same time, we also, uh, we also uh, value the contributions of the Syrian Democratic Forces, who have been uh, a good partner to us in helping address the, uh, um, the ISIL threat in the area. So uh, I think we, we see the need to continue to work with both of these organizations as we, as we move forward and, and address our principal threat, which is uh, the Islamic State. And, and Bob, I'm not, I'm, can you say your second question again? Well, whether it's possible or whether you're trying to increase the number of Arab fighters that you could put into that, that umbrella. Well, we group. certainly are. We certainly are. And, uh, you know, the, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which, you know, do include Kurds and, and Syrians and Turkmen and a variety of other elements that are all included in that really are proving to be uh, the force that is most capable against ISIL in that part of the of the theater. And what we do see is other other elements that want to align themselves with that as we move into other areas to liberate that. So we are going to continue and encourage that. And we certainly do see uh, the need for more forces to be aligned uh, with that element. General Pat Kevin here from Defense One. On the same topic, uh, in, the, in the last week, week and a half, Kurdish media has really exploded with, with uh, worry about the U.S. reaction or, or initial, I think, slow reaction to the, what was going on with Turkey, feeling like they had been stabbed in the back or, or, or somehow betrayed by, by, by U.S. forces who had helped get them to where they were. Are you seeing any, any battlefield repercussions of this, any type of lessening of, of of their, uh, you know, drive or willingness to work with the U.S. To, with with the mission <clears throat> against ISIL. I'm not. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I think we've uh, continued to enjoy. Uh, strong support uh, for the, the basing where we have our coalition aircraft and where we operate out of uh, in in uh, in Turkey, and they've continued to provide that as we move forward. Uh, and again, I think as we look at uh, some of their operations along the border here against ISIL uh, in some of the border towns, that is extraordinarily uh, welcome. So uh, I, I don't see 
any degradation to the support that we are getting right now with the campaign where or do you worry about the end point of, of these factions coming together in places like Raqqa to come, that they're going to be able to work together, that, like, as you all are saying, that they need to do? Well, uh, you, know, I've, I've, um, you know, I think as we kind of continue to make progress uh, in our campaign plan, both Iraq and Syria, I think as, as we begin to c dismantle and, and ultimately move uh, in the direction of defeat of ISIL, we will see some of these uh, other natural issues begin to, uh, to emerge. But I, I, what, I, what we are focused on is getting both uh, all of our partners focused in, keeping them focused in on, on the fight, which is against ISIL right now. <clears throat> Hi, General. I'd like to ask you about Yemen. Um, aid groups and the United Nations have reported uh, repeatedly targeting of civilian um, facilities and civilians in Yemen um, by the Houthis and also by the, the Saudi-led coalition. How do you see this issue, and what do you specifically? What do you believe is the American responsibility in thinking about civilian casualties in Yemen caused by the Saudi-led coalition, given the fact that the U.S. military is providing hands-on support to the the Saudi air campaign? Well, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I think it's well established. Our our our. The, the level of focus that we put on trying to prevent uh, <clears throat> civilian casualties, and that certainly represents our operational approach and it represents our values to how we conduct these operations. So, you know, I think part of our responsibility is to continue to emphasize to all the parties involved uh, their responsibilities to operate in a manner that absolutely minimizes the chances of civilian casualties. And so uh, we we continue to emphasize that to, to all of all of those partners that are involved in, in that aspect of the, of, 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 uh, of the conflict in, in Yemen. But just to follow up, do you think that the United States should withhold the enabling support to the Saudi-led coalition if civilians continue to be targeted? Uh, I, I think that's probably a, 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 a topic for our policy leaders to, to address, and so I'll leave that to them. I, I think what our responsibility is to do is, as military professionals is continue to stay engaged with our partners, encourage them to operate in a manner that accomplishes their mission, but yet uh, protects the civilians and doesn't add to a humanitarian, uh, uh, a devolving humanitarian situation on the ground. Thank you. Uh, General, I wonder if you could walk us through the next phase of the anti-ISIS operation. Uh, now that the, the Turks are in Syria, do you want them to go west as opposed to heading south to Manbij? And as everyone's, uh, Vice President Biden and others have said, they want the Kurds to move across east across the Euphrates. So just kind of walk us through what you would like to see as a military advantage. Well, I think, uh, I think uh, you know, what Tom, what we've seen with the Turkish operations up along the border, I think, are extraordinarily helpful to us, and they are the exact right, uh, right things that we need for the coalition. We need for the fight uh, against ISIL. So, what what I see moving forward is is making sure that we keep all of our partners and all of our force focused on ISIL at this particular point. I think we've got good momentum going against ISIL, and I think we need to continue to uh, emphasize that aspect of it. So, uh, you know, we we would. Uh, uh, you know, we are very much in favor of what the, the Turks are doing against ISIL along the border areas. Yeah, but again, do you want them to move west? What if they move south to Manbij, where the Kurds are? Do you see that as problematic? I, I don't. I, that's if, if the Kurds do not move east across Euphrates, will they, as Vice President Biden say, said, lose all U.S. support? Well, what we have made it clear is that our support is our support to all parties is contingent upon the focus on ISIL, and that will be how we will continue to do this. Uh, so, what we are trying to do is ensure that we keep uh, all of our partners focused on ISIL at this particular point. It's not helpful if they're infighting among themselves. We don't want that. We're working to uh, prevent that. Uh, but uh, it is, I think, m most important for us to continue to keep uh, the SDF and. The, our Turkish partners and the other coalition partners focused on ISIL at this particular point. Again, do the Kurds have to cross the Euphrates head east? The, the, the Kurds, for the most part, the, the, the portion of the Kurds that are part of the SDF are on the, are on the east side of the, of the Euphrates River at this, at this time. They have lived up to their, to their commitment to us. What about Manbij? 
in Manbij, I think it's important to understand that when you look at the SDF, the SDF is not just Kurds. It is, it is, there certainly has been a Kurdish element to that, but there's certainly been Syrian Arabs, there have been Syrian Turkmen, there have been Syrian others. So I think what you see in the Manbij area are forces that are left in place to hold and provide security that are principally made up of forces that come from that particular area. Uh, and so that, I think that's a, I think we should expect that that's going to occur. Um, and uh, and what we have what we have seen is that the, the 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 portion of the Kurdish elements that have supported that have largely moved back to the areas that they agreed to move back to. Bill Story of Reuters. So hi, hi General. Um, so just to follow up, then can you actually accomplish your campaign plan if the Kurds stay east? Indefinitely, and and do you believe that the Turks actually uh, agree with the construct of the of the F SDF itself, or do they uh, see it as a kind of a fig leaf for uh, a YPG force? Well, I think that's probably a that's probably a question you have to ask the Turks to comment on. I mean, I, I think our our responsibility is to make sure that as we work with our partners to make that we're transparent back and forth and under, understand who is. Who is who in that? Uh, and as as I just responded here, we do see there are certainly are Syrian Arabs and Turkmen and others that are involved in that broader SDF uh, piece. But to answer your basic question, yes, I do. I do think uh, with the Kurds staying in the area where we have asked them to stay and where they've returned, that does uh, contribute to our forward momentum and our continuing to uh, move forward in the in our campaign plan. Continue to hit, reach the other objectives within Syria as long as, even with the Kurds not participating, not moving west ever. Again. That's yes, I do believe we can. Tony Cassio, I want to go to uh, <clears throat> back to Iran since 20 percent of the world's oil goes through the Strait of Hormuz. Have you, in the last uh, three or four days, given it, gotten a sense of why the Iranians in, had those repeated actions last week? It, it's fairly extraordinary. They, this, these or, or the shots are fired. Uh, is there a change in the IRGC's thinking in terms of possibly more harassment of the United States? And since the world's oil community reacts to every hiccup over there, do you see the IRGC potentially harassing commercial traffic over there, oil traffic? Well, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't think I can get inside the mind of the <clears throat> the Iranian regime and the IRGC to understand exactly what they're thinking in terms of their actions. And uh, while, while we saw some activity here in the last couple of weeks, uh, that's that's not particularly new. We've seen that over time. And uh, you know, as I think as we've as we've reported in the past, you know, that <clears throat> about ten. 10 percent of the normal interactions that we have in there are things that we would consider to be unprofessional, unsafe, and that's been a factor over time. Uh, I, I guess I would point out this, is that, you know, I, Iran's actions here are in the Arabian Gulf are unlike anybody else. No one else does what they do in the Arabian Gulf. They don't go out and they don't uh, drive uh, fast boats towards the military vessels out there in the same way that they do. And nobody else does that. And so, you know, what, what in, in international waters. And so what, you know, what I call on Iran to do is to be, is to be the professional force that they claim to be. Uh, professional militaries, professional maritime forces don't operate in that way. We acknowledge all all parties, uh, all countries in that area have the have the right to operate in international uh, waters, but they should do so in a responsible manner. And what we see with the Iranians is not particularly responsible. It is provocative in some cases. It's unsafe, uh, and uh, it it can lead to situations where we may not be able to de-escalate in a time before something happens. Um, so uh, I'm I'm very uh, focused on this, and I'm, I'm very proud of the way that our forces operate and the way they conduct themselves. I think they are, we are very professional. I think they're very measured. Uh, I think we're applying our values as we do this, but I, I am concerned about those types of activities that are just plain unprofessional and really aren't, uh, don't, aren't replicated by anybody else operating in the area. Any sense, though, that, you know, the, the world oil community wants to feel this, there's some security there. They're, do you get a sense that the Iranians may try to harass commercial? I don't have any sense that they're going to try to harass any any commercial, any commercial activities. Uh, just to follow up on Tony's question, General Hotel, uh, the great landmark between the United States and Iran in the past decade has been this nuclear accord, and since the accord was reached, we've seen a, a doubling of 
harassment of uh, U.S. Navy ships. Uh, we've seen a number of ballistic missile launches. Uh, has this nuclear agreement, in, in fact, emboldened in Iran? Well, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know. If, I'm not sure I'm qualified to make that uh, that that uh, that assessment, Lucas. But I, but I would say that uh, we haven't seen a significant change in their behavior, just as we've kind of been talking about here, with with the uh, with the uh, with the agreement. Um, so to me, that 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 remains a, remains a concern, and it remains something we're going to have to continue to to deal with in this part of the world and pay attention to. And as as regards to the other capabilities that they're beginning to add, uh, you know, we're, as a CENTCOM commander, it's certainly my responsibility to pay very close attention to that and provide advice to the secretary on how we how we should be uh, looking at that and dealing with that if we're if we're going to uh, uh, have to do something there. Um, so we're paying very very close attention to all of that. Do you attribute this newfound Iranian aggressiveness? Uh, to say that uh, since the deal, uh, instead of Iran dialing back its behavior, they've in fact become more emboldened. I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm not. I, I, you'd have to really have to talk to the Iranian regime leadership about this. I, what I see is this is principally the regime leadership trying to exert their influence and, and authority in the region, uh, and they are trying to do it in provocative ways that uh, that are unsafe, unprofessional, and really I think work against their uh, their objectives in the long term here. Uh, but I, I'd, I'd want to emphasize that uh, you know about 90 percent of these these unsafe, unprofessional activities we see come from the Iranian uh, Quds Force Navy vessels. Uh, they don't come from the general Iranian Navy. Uh, only a very, very small percentage of them uh, do. So this is, in my view, is, is not about the Iranian people. It's about the Iranian regime and their desire to continue to do these types of things that stoke um, uh, instability or attempt to stoke instability in the region. Louis Martinez, ABC. Okay. we got more people here. Thank you. Um, okay, if I ask you about Mosul and what happened in Hasaka, the timelines for Mosul, do you think right now that the Iraqi forces are prepared to launch uh, an offensive to retake Mosul sometime by the end of the year or in, you know, even sooner than that? And what the incident that happened in Hasaka when you set up the combat air patrols, what do you think the motivations were for the Syrians in doing what they did? And do you think that, um, I mean, how close were they to American forces on the ground? Well, uh, first of all, with respect to Mosul, you know, I think as the prime minister has said, it's his intention to try to get to get through Mosul by the end of the year. Uh, my assessment is, in, over the course of my visits, I think, is that they are on track to achieve that objective. They own the timeline here for this, and so uh, we'll continue to, uh, to continue to work very, very closely with them and ensure that we can support their operations when they're ready to go. But I, I think we are proceeding apace uh, exactly where we hope to be at this particular time. I think we're there with respect to that. Um, with regard to what the Syrian regime um, excuse me, um, uh, motivations might have been in Hasaka, again, I'm, I'm not sure I can speculate uh, too much on that. Uh, um, you know, it, uh, whether it's uh, their concern of maintaining some level of, uh, of uh, lines of communication or something back and forth there, I, I, I'm not sure. I'd just be speculating on what their motivations, uh, motivations might be. How close did they get to American forces uh, that were operating with our partners there? I think they were, uh, I think they were several hundred meters uh, away from areas in which we were uh, uh, close enough to be concerned but uh, wasn't uh, an immediate direct threat. Jamie Maxwell. Hi, uh, Jamie Wright here with the Washington Examiner. There's been a, a, a perception over the over recent days that part of the reason that there were the clashes between Turkish forces and Kurdish forces in northern Syria is that Turkey failed to adequately coordinate with the United States, that in, in the sense that the U.S. would have while this operation was welcome, it would have been more welcome if it had come after the U.S. was able to, to get some of the Kurdish elements to move out of the way. Did Turkey jump the gun? Uh, I'm not, I wouldn't say they jumped the gun. And I think, you know, as, as they went across into Durabolus, I would highlight to you that we did support that operation focused on ISIL. Uh, and uh, I mean, certainly, you know, uh, um, you know, one of the one of the things I think all military leaders try to do is look for opportunities and to move on those opportunities very, very quickly. And so, you know, I think they saw an opportunity. We moved. They moved quickly on that, uh, and we tried to support them uh, as as we did, and, and we did support them when they 
began to focus on something other than ISIL, then I think we had to withdraw our, our support for that. Uh, and, uh, and so I think we are, we are now trying to keep, keep those elements uh, separated and focused on, focused on the counter-ISIL fight at this point. Are you surprised by that quick move? Um, not, not particularly. I mean, I think we saw some indications that uh, they, were, they were doing that. But again, um, you know, it's an opportunity, and we look for opportunities as well, and we want to be able to move quickly. And it was focused on ISIL initially, and so I'm, we're glad that they moved in when they saw an opportunity against ISIL. All right, General, uh, two questions. One is, could you provide a bit of an assessment of, of the forces inside Mosul? It's, it kind of ranges from this could be a huge fight to maybe everybody's going to melt away. And then also, what's the, what is your thinking kind of post-Mosul, post-Raqqa, um, past the caliphate, as it were? Yeah, thanks. You're talking about, when you say forces inside Mosul, you're talking about Islamic State. Yeah, correct. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think, uh, uh, I th you know, I think one of the effects that we are creating is ISIL is having to make hard decisions because they're getting pressured in a variety of, of ways, uh, certainly in both Iraq and Syria, uh, uh, and uh, at a lot of locations, we are continuing to uh, target their leadership. We're continuing to target their revenue generation sources in both Mosul and uh, in northern Iraq, and certainly in Syria. So I think we uh, we continue to keep them on the horns of a dilemma here. So they're having to make uh, decisions. I, it's interesting to me as you look at the Battle of Manbij, which took place over the course of about 74, 75 days. A very difficult fight, a very uh, concentrated urban fight uh, where there was extensive use of IEDs, there were use of tunnels, there were fighting inside buildings. Uh, and by the way, the SDF, in my view, the, the leadership of the SDF exhibited great skill and concern for civilians and how they approached that and, and, and I think took a very deliberate manner to that. When you look at Jerobolis, uh, when applied pressure there, they very quickly, uh, they very quickly left that area. So, Gordon, I think what, what you're seeing is I think we should expect um, that in some places, perhaps in some parts of, of, uh, of Mosul, they will cede that area to us, um, or to the coalition, to the Iraqis. Uh, and then in other areas, they will, uh, they will fight harder to hold on to that. And I think that's, I think that's uh, what we're going to see going forward here. They are going to have to make hard decisions about where they're going to concentrate their power and where they're going to have to uh, let, the, let the coalition and, the, and our indigenous partners uh, succeed, and that's, that's kind of what I see going forward. To the second part of your problem, or to your question, I'm sorry, um, is that, you know, again, uh, as, as the Secretary has said, uh, the, you know, going to Raqqa and Mosul and, and addressing the core of ISIL in, in Iraq and Syria is very, very important. But as we've learned about this enemy, one, they are very connected. Uh, so things that happen in, in Iraq and Syria resonate in other places and are resonating in our capitals and Europe and other, other locations. So it's a connected network. They are very vulnerable, they are, and we are seeing that. And, and as we present them with lots of dilemmas, they're having to react, they're having to make these very difficult decisions, but they are also very adaptive. And so we should expect that as they as we come out of the big operations like uh, Mosul and Raqqa and others here, that they will continue to adapt and we will continue to deal with uh, with um, the next evolution of ISIL, whether they become more of a terrorist organization and, re and return to more of their terrorist-like uh, roots. But I, I think we uh, we are thinking very hard about how we, with the coalition and with our Iraqi and and ultimately with our partners in Syria, how we, look at, uh, how we look at continuing to keep the pressure on ISIL after we complete these, uh, these, these major operations. I don't want to give any impression that when, we're, when we finish with Mosul or Raqqa that we're done. We're not. We will continue to deal with them. Back to Turkey and Syria. Uh, analysts are worried and concerned and wondering whether or not Turkey will continue to move forward against ISIL or will retreat back across the border uh, and just contain the problem rather than work on solving it and defeating ISIS. Have you received any assurances for, from Turkey that they are going to continue this fight inside Syria? I, I haven't received any particular assurances, but, you know, I, I think 
what we what we have seen is we have seen them move from Gerobolus, uh west along the border, and I think that is extraordinarily good news. That's very helpful to us, uh, and uh, in our in our other partnering efforts with them over on uh, in the uh, Mara Line area, we've seen them continue to uh, to uh, support those operations. I think those are extraordinarily positive. Um, so in this case, deeds matter, and what 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 I'm seeing on the ground is that they they remain very committed to the ISIL. Fight. They've said that, and we will take them at their word for that. Very eager gentleman in the middle here. If you could identify yourself, gentlemen. Okay. Rahim Rashidi with Kurdistan TV. What will be Peshmerga role in Mosul operation? Well, the, again, I won't get into the specific details of what uh, what each of the what each of the uh, elements will do as part of uh, as part of the Mosul operation. But I will tell you, as as I mentioned, uh, we we have a very aggressive uh, and uh, I think a very uh, interact interactive uh, uh, planning process going on that includes the Peshmerga, that includes the ISF, that includes other uh, other uh, entities in uh, in uh, in Iraq, and making sure that we. Have have the we have the right uh, uh, the right uh, the right mix of forces to do this. In my uh, recent discussions with President Barzani, as recently as a week or so ago, uh, he continued to commit his pledge to continue to work with the Iraq the government of Iraq forces, the Iraqi security forces, in helping with this. So we expect everyone to play a critical a critical role in uh, in in uh, in the Mosul operation, and 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 so far I think we're seeing that, and we're seeing good interchange right now between the military and political elements to, to continue to address all the very complex issues that have to be addressed in a, in a large German area like Mosul. Christina Wong. Oh, thank you. Um, back to the um, Iranian provocations, do you think that the, the recent provocations are indicative of a worsening U.S.-Iranian military relationship as to the, to the extent that there is a relationship? Um, and, you know, what is the fear there? Is there a fear of miscalculation? Um, what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, I, you know, again, I, 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 we don't really have a military relationship with uh, with Iran, so I, I, I can't say if it's if no if no relationship is getting worse or not. But it's it is what it is, and it's it's pretty much been the been the same. I, th I think the big concern here is miscalculation. Uh, that uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm very confident in the measures that our uh, maritime forces are taking. Uh, they are measured. They are deliberate in the things that they are doing. Uh, but ultimately, we are going to protect ourselves um, if uh, if that comes to a situation. So I am concerned about uh, rogue commanders, rogue Iranian Quds Force naval commanders who are operating in a provocative manner and are trying to test us, because ultimately we will prevail here. Uh, and uh, I'm very very, very confident of that, and uh, and uh, we certainly don't want that to come to pass, uh, and that's why I call on them to act in the professional manner that they espouse to act, uh, particularly in the international waters. Would you say the calls are getting closer? The what? Uh, has there been any close calls, in other words? Well, I mean, I think these are all close calls. And uh, for those of you that were with with us when we saw this, I mean, it's a, it's it, we're talking seconds here. So, uh, I mean, this is very, very, uh, this is very important uh, uh, work that our people do here, and it is there. We are having, we are relying on our good young leaders and our young sailors out there to make good decisions, and, and in every case that I've seen, they have made very, very good decisions. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, as if they continue to test this, uh, we're we're going to respond and we're going to protect ourselves and our partners. In the back, JJ Green and please hear please. General. Um, Two of your spokesmen told us recently, um, Captain Davis last week said you're expecting some very tough fighting in Iraq uh, and in Syria as these battles continue to unfold. Uh, and Colonel Garber said uh, about a week or so ago as well that there are some very visible signs that the Islamic State organization is weakening, but they're preparing for some tough fights to come. I want to make sure I understood you correctly. Were you saying that you think that they will just essentially cede Mosul to the coalition, or do you expect a big, tough fight there? No, I think that it will be a tough fight. What I think they're, what I think they will do is they will have to make some decisions about uh, perhaps towns and uh, portions of uh, areas in which we're operating that they will, they will not. 
they will not defend, they will not expend a lot of their efforts in order to kind of focus on those things that are most important to them. Um, so, you know, I think in some areas we'll be able to move uh, uh, perhaps a little bit more quickly. But I, I do expect, based on what I've, uh, what we've seen here in Manbidge, what we've experienced, as we get, we are, we are at a point here where we are now into, we are really into the heart of the caliphate. Uh, we are, we are moving into Mosul. We are moving towards uh, towards Raqqa here very very soon. And these are extraordinarily important cities for us. And so, you know, as as I as I learned in my career, and as I encourage my uh, commanders here, we have to respect our enemy, uh, and he is going to defend what he has what he has taken and hold, held for a long period of time. And so, we should expect that there will be hard and difficult fighting there. There will be extensive use of IEDs. There will be uh, very difficult urban fighting. There will be a mixture of civilians and and fighting forces in there. They will use civilians as uh, as shields for them, as we've seen them do in a variety of locations. And that will make it more challenging for our for our people. We will have to be more deliberate. We will have to be more careful as we proceed through that. But I am confident that in the end we will prevail uh, through that. So I think they will they will they will some areas they will not concentrate in, but other areas they definitely will concentrate in. Do you think it, it can be done by the end of the year, like the Prime Minister suggested or asked? Well, as, as, I, as I think as I mentioned before, it's the Prime Minister's objective to have that done by the end of the year. And uh, right now, I think, uh, our, you know, obviously that they, they own the timeline in this. So they're, we're, we're supporting them with this. Uh, my, my indications are, my assessment is, is that we can, we can meet the uh, – we can meet the, the Prime Minister's uh, the objectives if that's that's what he chooses to do. Thank you. David Martin, CBS. Who in ISIS is making these decisions about whether to stand and fight or to uh, melt away? Is this the central leadership or these local commanders? And is there any pattern that, to their move, movements that tells you what they what they value most, what what they're going to hang on to hardest? Uh, I, I'm not sure I can uh, I can answer your question about who is making those decisions. I'm certainly uh, I mean th this is uh, this is a very this is a strong network. They do rely on uh, on guidance from their centralized leadership. So I would imagine there is some um, there is some uh, indication that there's uh, that there's direction coming. I mean some of what we saw in the Manbidge fight was direction from uh, Baghdadi to to his fighters to fight to the death. Obviously they didn't so they didn't follow his direction which may be an indication of uh, of uh, of the state of uh, of ISIL or at least in some cases here so i do think there is direction coming from the centralized leadership but uh, but again we have to respect our enemy and we have to recognize that he has he has leadership at the lower level that is also going to uh, continue to to make decisions down there about uh, about uh, about what they're doing and i'm sorry david the second party question what are you most what are the, what what are they likely to hang on to the heart? Well, I think they, uh, I think they will uh, try to hang on to those uh, certainly areas that are revenue generating for them that allow them to uh, continue to uh, to support the the caliphate. That I think are will be very very important for them. Uh, Certainly, uh, iconic, uh, uh, you know, uh, locations within uh, either of those uh, those cities or other locations are important to them. I think it's important for them to uh, probably to have a, ca a, a capital of the caliphate. So, uh, you know, as they, as they define that, I think they'll probably identify areas that are that are perhaps more defendable or or more important to them, and they'll continue to try to hold on to that. Thank you. Uh, General, I wanted to follow up on a uh, response that you gave to Gordon about what Mosul looks like after its eventual fall. You made reference to the fact that the fight against ISIS will continue, that the, it won't end, and that, that they are adaptable. Well, I was wondering if you could offer some specifics about what does that look like. Are you worried about the potential that they would then carry out terror attacks in Europe, in the West, that they would try to expand the caliphate to other places like in Asia? And secondly, I was wondering if you could tell us uh, um, about the U.S. efforts to get back hostages held in Afghanistan, like Katie Coleman. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. So, you know, as we, as we, one of the things that we've we've seen is uh, is you know some of these horrific. Uh, 
um, IED, vehicle-borne IED, or suicide attacks in Baghdad in the past as we put pressure on that. You know, fortunately, we've worked very closely with the Iraqi uh, government to begin to address that. And, uh, and, I, and again, I think that's an area where we're, we're making some progress. We haven't completely eliminated it, but we have, uh, through our work together, enabled the Iraqi forces to go after that network that is pursuing that. So I think as, as we look in the wake of a, a big operation like Mosul, I think it is, uh, it is possible that we will see some of those type of terrorist attacks, that they will try to, again, go after vulnerable locations with uh, vehicle-borne IEDs uh, to uh, continue to uh, challenge, uh, challenge the, the, the government and the forces that have, uh, that have taken that. I expect that we will, as we do in, in northern Syria, we will continue to see them continue to <clears throat> counterattack and try to retake some key locations for them. Uh, and, and certainly, as, as, as the, as the as the physical caliphate uh, disintegrates and as it as it uh, as it uh, as it comes apart as we dismantle it, I, I think as as I've indicated, I think that they will return to more of their terrorist-like roots, and so they will continue to try to either direct or uh, support or potentially inspire attacks outside of uh, outside of the core in in Iraq and uh, in Syria. And so I think we we should expect to see that, and uh, and that is why I think it's as the secretary said, it's we've got we certainly got to address what's happening in Iraq and Syria, but that's not sufficient. We've got to look much broader at all of our efforts to address the address the threat that they pose transregionally as well as in this particular area. Any comments? On, uh, on the hostages, uh, um, you know, uh, certainly when uh, Americans are taken captive, uh, uh, this becomes an immediate priority for us. I, you know, I, uh, we are paying extraordinarily close attention to that. We always do. We, uh, I won't get into too many more details with that, but uh, um, I'm, I'm satisfied that we are uh, doing everything we can at this juncture to understand who took them and to uh, try to get them back. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, I had three very quick questions on this operations in Syria. First, uh, can you clarify the airstrikes that you conducted when the Turks started the operation in, in Jarablus? Did you hit Jarablus, and did you get any advance notice from the Turks on this operation? The secondly, do you have any communication channels with the FSA units advancing from uh, Jarablus to Membic? Are you allowed legally to coordinate airstrikes with CIA back groups on the ground in Membic bucket? And the third, do you have any information about what happened to ISAM militants who left the border areas? Are you concerned that they can act under the umbrella of FSA? Well, I think the fact that we provided uh, uh, some air support to the operations in Durablos indicates that there was some coordination beforehand. So yes, we, you know, we didn't. It was not an extensive planning period for this. It was uh, we were taking advantage of an opportunity that uh, uh, that our Turkish partners identified, and so uh, you know. Largely because of the of the basing that Turkey provides us uh, for coalition uh, aircraft, we were able to respond very very quickly uh, in that situation. So yes, we, we we were able to respond and do it in a time that was timely for their particular operations. Um, we are not uh, necessarily directly talking to all of those uh, partners. We do work through our Turkish partners uh, to communicate to them and uh, communicate what is happening. So uh, we try to use all uh, mechanisms of communication uh, back and forth here with how we talk to uh, the various partners. Uh, with respect to where uh, any, I think your last question was where the Islamic State members in Jarablus went to, uh, I think there's a variety of places they could have gone. They certainly could have gone uh, further to the west, the southwest, down and towards the al -Bab area. They could have moved down towards uh, Raqqa. Those are uh, areas where there are uh, presence of uh, Islamic uh, State forces. So my, my my expectation is they would have moved to areas where they uh, could have uh, received support from Islamic uh, state elements, which might be those locations. The last one, are you concerned that they can act under the umbrella of FSA? Uh, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we. Uh, you know, that's that's something uh, we 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 pay some attention to here, uh, but uh, uh, I don't know that we've necessarily seen indications of that at this particular point. Just a quick uh, 
Uh, General, are you concerned at all? Were you expressing any concerns that Turkish there are U.S. advisors with SDF forces as Turkey targets SDF forces in these clashes? Was there any? Is there a concern about U.S. advisors embedded with the SDF? Hey, we've been uh, we've been co-located with the Turks. Turkish forces for a long period of time, and so uh, they, they 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 know very well where we are. So uh, you know, we may remind them, but frankly, I think our, our coordination and our situational awareness with uh, with the Turkish uh, Turkish forces, Turkish led forces, is good, and that that was not an immediate immediate concern for me. My I think we have had good situational awareness with uh, with the Turks. There is a recently a two star was dismissed from European command due to personal issues. Are you at all as a combatant commander? Are you concerned about the vetting or clearance process with the generals with access to sensitive information in your command? I, I think that's uh, I, I don't know all the details of that particular situation. I'm, I think what we go through to prepare leaders is is very sufficient. If I could, just for a moment, I would like to just make two points here as I close. Not so fast. Um, first of all, two points I just emphasize with you. Uh, we do see momentum building in, in Iraq and Syria. And as, uh, as I've kind of commented to several of you, uh, this is a really, I think, the biggest concern that I have as a CENTCOM commander is maintaining our momentum in the fight. And the intent going forward is to continue to support our partners and help them maintain that momentum. Uh, so that is a very key piece for me as the CENTCOM commander. I would just also point out that we have extraordinarily good partners as we, as we move forward. We talked about a variety of them here in this room, but Certainly, as in a large coalition here that we have, uh, uh, we uh, we are very well supported. I spent a good amount of time in the region over the last five months, and I've gotten out to see a lot of our partners. I'm very encouraged by the strength of our relationship and the willingness of our partners and our allies to continue to do what is necessary to achieve our common objectives against the Islamic State. And I am confident that that's going to be the case going forward. So, thanks once again for the opportunity to talk with you. I look forward to seeing you again.